All right, let's look at this example of applying the standard strategy. As a reminder, the steps in standard strategy are draw the free body diagram, define the coordinate axis, break forces into components along these axes, and finally, this is what all these steps are leading up to, write the Newton's second law equations. All right, let's look at the question. It says, one end of a uh, length of a uh, rope is tied to a tree. The other end is tied to a car stuck in the mud. The motorist pulls sideways on the midpoint of the rope, displacing it a distance of 2 meters. Assume the car slides slightly, but then becomes stuck again. If he exerts a force of some amount of newtons under these conditions, determine the force exerted on the car. All right, it sounds like I should draw a figure. So let me start by drawing the tree and the car. And I guess they're connected by a rope, but it's not going to be in a straight line because it gets displaced at the midpoint. So let me draw this displaced midpoint of the rope. And this is the rope. I should have some length labels here. So the length of the this portion of the rope is half of the whole length of the rope. And I'm going to give this portion of the length a label delta x. In this question, this would be 2 meters. All right, the question says determine the force exerted on the car. So I guess it's asking for tension force exerted on the car. All right. So I guess here there is a pre-standard uh, strategy. By pre, I mean we need to draw free body diagram, which means we are drawing a diagram of forces acting on something. So the question is, what is that something? I hope after a short bit of thinking, you see that it's not the force on the car that we want to diagram because if we knew that, then we would know the answer already. So that's not what we are ready to draw quite yet. We are looking for the tension. And I hope you remember from your reading or somewhere that you know some properties of tension that if there's a tension pulling on the car this way then this is kind of everywhere on the rope so if I look at this portion of the rope then there's tension pulling it down this way there's on that portion there's tension pulling it down this way and this uh, uh, same tension is pulling on the tree this way there's all these tension forces that you can take any one particular point on the rope and it's being uh, pulled apart. That's what tension does in, uh, in both the directions along the rope. So I hope all of that sounds familiar, which means if we can find the tension along any point on the rope, then we'll have our answer. So in the question, we are given how much force we apply on this portion of the rope. So that makes me think I can draw a free body diagram of this point here and that'll get me to figuring out what the tension forces are. So let's draw the free body diagram of this point on the rope. I mean, I kind of just did there, but let me draw a bigger version. So this is a standard strategy step number one, drawing free body diagram. And I'm drawing free body diagram of that point on the rope. Good thing I'm already <laughs> representing objects by point. So there's the apply the force F drawn in the vertical direction in the way we are drawing it right now. And we have the tension force. It's uh, being applied at an angle so I better label it on my diagram up there 
and I will use the same label for the free body diagram. So the angle I feel is easiest to express is this one here. Let me call that theta. And if you find that same theta on the free body diagram, you will find them here and here. And staring at this geometry for a while, I hope you can figure out what uh, expression theta has. So we have this L over 2, we have this delta x, so theta should be arc sine of delta x over L over 2. That's why I was labeling those lengths. Alright, good. The next step is to define the coordinate axis. And this is where I said we normally pick it along the direction of acceleration. And here it says becomes stuck again, which means as the driver is applying a force, nothing is moving. So I think the acceleration is zero. So what do you do on, in those cases? So it's actually even better. Um, when acceleration is zero, you have complete freedom to choose whatever coordinate axis you want. Normally, you should use this freedom to um, minimize the number of forces that you have to decompose into components. So let me choose my axis so that the y-axis is along the applied force F. That way, I don't have to decompose F. And it looks like even though I have two tension forces, if I decompose one of them, then the other one will look exactly the same. All right, so next step. I have to break forces into components. So the only force I need to worry about right now is the tension force. There's technically two of them, but let me just do one as an example. So the tension can be broken into Y component and the X component. And this angle here is the same angle as that theta. So the Y component should look like T sine theta because it's opposite to that angle. And the X component looks like T cosine theta because it's adjacent to that angle. Good. All right, now we are ready. We should write down the Newton's second law equations. That is net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And you might be wondering, what mass? Uh, we are drawing a little segment of the rope. But not to worry, the acceleration is zero. So either way, it's going to be zero anyway. So that makes our job easier. And in this case, let me cut out on some unnecessary work. And I won't even write down any equations along the x-axis because I can see from this diagram that x component of one tension force will cancel out the x component of the other tension force. Doesn't give me any information. So I'll focus on what happens with y components of the forces. So writing out that y component forces, net force in the y direction, or F, the applied force, minus, and remember there are those two tension forces, 2 times T sine theta is equal to 0. And that is the end of the standard strategy. We have one equation and one unknown. So great, I think we can solve it pretty easily. Let's go ahead and do that. Solving that expression for tension force, I get T is equal to the applied force F divided by 2 sine theta. So I hope you see that if this sine theta is a small value, then the tension is going to be a bigger value compared to this applied force F. And that's actually one of the reasons I like this example. It's one of the early examples of what we call simple machine, where you gain a force multiplier. You apply some amount of force F, and the force output that you get is greater than the force that you put in. Uh, by some arrangement of um, things. So let me, I guess, uh, first work out the angle theta. I think that will give you some idea of what kind of multiplier we get. 
So looking at this information here, I guess we can work out the sine theta directly without um, putting it through any trig functions. Because looking at that expression, we should have sine theta is equal to delta x over l over 2 or 2 delta x over l. And we are given those numbers, 2 times 2 meters divided by L, 36 meters. Or 4 divided by 36, or 1 over 9. Plugging that in, we get tension is the applied force divided by 2 over 9. So we are going to get a force multiplier of almost a factor of 4. Or, actually plugging in numbers, 517.5 newtons. It's quite a bit greater than the applied force. And this uh, is a simple machine, similar to a mechanical lever that you might have seen in other contexts earlier. So this problem is also a kind of an example of a type of question that you will see more later in the class. It's called a static equilibrium. And a key condition in static equilibrium is that the acceleration is zero. And you will see some Newton's law problems like that right now in the next couple of weeks. And a little bit later in the semester, after we do rotations, we'll look at more situations where there's one additional condition that gets brought in. These static equilibrium problems are important for two reasons. One, they are very practical. This is the type of thing that you would see often in engineering contexts. Two, the fact that acceleration is zero makes it easier to have more complicated situations that are still solvable. So it ends up giving you more geometry practice. So it's good to um, have that practice. All right, so I have more examples. Until next time, bye.